Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to our briefing, Natural Climate Solutions. I'm Dan Bursett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program that provides technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for energy efficiency, renewable energy, and beneficial electrification for their customers. ESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts are always free online at www.eesi.org. If you would like to make sure you always receive our latest educational resources, just take a moment to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Our briefing today is the third in our series, What Congress Needs to Know About COP27. And we're very proud to present it today in partnership with our friends at US Nature for Climate. Thanks to Nathan Henry and his contacts and colleagues who helped us assemble this excellent panel today. We began our briefing series with a discussion of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent findings as presented in the sixth assessment report. Last week, we focused on loss and damage or climate impacts that cannot be adapted to, which will be one of the most talked about issues at COP27. If you missed either briefing, you can watch the archived webcast by visiting us online at www.esi.org. And be sure to sign up for the fourth briefing in the series on Wednesday, November 2nd, which will cover what's on the table at the negotiations. Natural climate solutions, which are conservation, restoration, and improved land management strategies that help remove carbon from the air while also keeping our air and water clean and our soil healthy and productive, will be discussed in the context of the upcoming international climate negotiations. Here in the United States, farmers, ranchers, foresters, and other agricultural producers are already incorporating natural climate solutions into their land use and conservation practices. As an example, farmers who practice regenerative agriculture realize multiple economic, climate, and societal benefits and have for a very long time. To learn more about regenerative agriculture, check out our June 2022 briefing that was presented in partnership with the Natural Resources Defense Council. We anticipate that natural climate solutions are primed for robust discussion when negotiators and observers arrive in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt in just over a week for the 27th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP27. And this is one area where U.S. leadership, demonstrated by Congress on a bipartisan basis, could set a very positive example of showcasing forestry, coastal management, and sustainable agricultural practices that contribute to climate uh, mitigation and adaptation, while also helping to feed people and producing valuable crops and commodities. To keep up with natural climate solutions at COP27, along with all the other key issues like loss and damage and international climate finance, I encourage you to sign up for our special newsletter, COP27 Dispatch, that will be published every day while the negotiations are taking place. You can visit us online at www.eesi.org forward slash subscribe to sign up for COP27 Dispatch, as well as our regular bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Before I introduce our panel, let me remind everyone that we will have some time today for questions and we will do our best to incorporate questions from our, on, from our online audience. If you have a question, you can send it to us via email at ASK or ask at EESI.org, or even better, follow us on Twitter at EESI online and send it to us that way. The first of our four panelists today is John Verdick. John is the Director of International Climate Policy at the Nature Conservancy. In this role, he works to improve policy coherence between international climate change rule sets and national level action in the land sector. John formerly worked at the U.S. State Department, where he negotiated work streams related to forests, carbon markets, and the Paris Agreement's rule sets for nationally determined contributions in greenhouse gas accounting. John, welcome to our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Dan. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here and appreciate all the interest from everybody out there and um, and what's going to be happening with COP coming up and, and how it relates with natural climate solutions. Um, I'm going to share my a few slides here and, and walk you through a few thoughts of, of where we're going to see um, NCS play and, and how we kind of increase ambition going forward and, and build international trust. So um, as Dan said, COP's in, a, in about a week uh, get started. So why have a COP? Um, why even do this? You know, we now know, and, and we've known for a long time, that climate change affects the entire globe. 
that no country can solve it alone as hard as they might try at home. We're going to need international cooperation to make sure that everybody is reducing their emissions as much as they can and building more resilience for the future. Many countries in, in the negotiating groups um, also link up their climate change negotiations along with trade actions and, and things like that. So we need to make sure that countries are moving together. And the one way we really know to do that is through the United Nations. It's not always pretty getting 190 plus countries to come to an agreement. Um, I'm sure those of you that work in Congress know this as well, that sometimes it's extremely hard to get that many people together agreeing. Everybody's making um, some different compromises, but you know, even if things stall and it takes a while, you need to come back, keep talking and keep moving. So one of the good pieces that we know now after this many cops and the 27th coming up here is that most of the Paris rule book, most of the rules are agreed. We know what to do but sometimes we still don't have the means of implementation. And by that, I'm gonna to talk to a little bit of how do we do the work on the ground and how do we get the finance for it? So what is in the Paris rule book? Well, just a couple of things. There's a lot of things in there, but a few that are really important for this discussion today and natural climate solutions is, we know that countries have to submit a pledge called a nationally determined contribution, an NDC. The NDC basically comes out of what is in the country's greenhouse gas inventory and you build it up and you make the forward looking projection that becomes your pledge. Now, the language, all sinks and all sources of greenhouse gas emissions exists already in the Paris Agreement. It was written in there on purpose. We wanted to make sure that we're looking at different sources of greenhouse gas emissions. That means emissions coming out of whether it be energy, transportation, et cetera. But we also wanted to look at the natural sinks that can go into countries' reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. Are you improving your natural habitat enough that it's actually absorbing and reducing emissions? And the other thing, you know, kind of really basic, but you need a couple years. Um, you can't just say we're going to reduce our emissions by 30% and not say between which two years. You need two data points to draw a line to make that kind of projection going forward. So we know from the United States, it's 2005 through 2030 at the moment. Um, and it was the previous NDC was through 2025. Really important because then we start to see the bending of the curve as we go forward into the next NDCs. And, and with that, countries also have to report on their NDCs. You put out a pledge and then every couple of years you have to come back and actually show, are you meeting that pledge? Are you on track to meet it? And then each five years, we want countries to come back and make a better pledge to enhance the last one. We're learning, we're getting better. And then each time the hope is that we ratchet down emissions by all these different countries kind of collectively seeing each other take action and then jumping in there and, and reducing their own emissions as well. Now, um, natural climate solutions, as I mentioned, the, um, the sinks and sources. Natural climate solutions, you know, if, if we look at this graph, we came out with a kind of a seminal research study back in 2017 from Nature Conservancy and, and numerous other partners that came out and looked at where are the business as usual emissions going? Um, and that's the top line that you see going across. And we saw it growing and growing, and it's not great. Um, but we, we're trying to look at what are the different solutions? How can we get to the reductions that are needed to keep us below the two degrees Celsius pathway? Um, and if anybody has the question as well too, the 1.5 Celsius pathway works in this as too, but we had to pick a number back then. So it, it's kind of the same calculation. But if you look in the middle of this graph and you see the green wedge in there, the green wedge is all from natural climate solutions. It's forests, it's agriculture, and it's land use pathways. We know that where that dotted red line of 2030 is that about 37% um, or you know, greater than a third of the emissions needed to get on that two degree target can come from natural climate solutions by 2030. So these are very near-term emission reductions. As we look at the wedge as it builds out further, you'll see the wedge of fossil fuel mitigation, energy, transportation, et cetera, grows and becomes more and more important. So not to say that's not important, but this is an and. We need all of the different sectors to do the most they can. Within this, we also broke it down to how many emission, emission reductions could we get globally each year. Um, and starting to look at this, we see reforestation is the largest wedge. Um, this is globally, so not just the United States, and we break it down by countries as well, and I'll show you that in a second. Another thing to highlight is on the left, you see the green circle with forests, you see the yellow with agricultural lands and grasslands and wetlands. Um, you know, all of these together are what makes up eventually that third of, of greenhouse gas emissions that are needed. Now, other important things in this chart, when you look at the bottom right corner of other benefits, there are all these different benefits that come out of natural climate solutions, and they're not just reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. We get cleaner air, we get better biodiversity um, 
impacts. We have cleaner water and we have a healthier soil. So within this, you see all these little dots kind of towards the left side with the names of the different categories and pathways that we've looked at this and nearly all of these have all sorts of, you know, extra external um, benefits that come into it as well. So as we look at implementing this on the ground, natural climate solutions on the ground, we're also implementing all of these other uh, co-benefits as well. Um, this NCS Atlas, um, we tried to break this down by state as well too, looking at the different possibilities from where we could get how many reductions. And then another thing that's kind of interesting, and, and this is all available on the Nature for Climate website um, under uh, the US uh, mapper, and you look at the 770 you know, million tons of CO2 equivalent per year that can be reduced in the United States if we took all measures possible. Um, this is also looking at about $100 per ton when you come out with this larger number. But we've included these slide bars to the left if you look at the mitigation pathways um, box. And you can kind of look by state or you can look by the whole country and look do you have a budget that is looking at carbon valued at $10 per ton, $50 per ton, or $100 per ton? And then you can kind of start to toggle this a little bit to look at locally impactful um, areas where it might be best for you or your state or your country or anybody to start really start pushing and, and finding where the, uh, the best impacts you can get are. Now, going back to COP. We saw in the United Nations or the United States' new um, NDC, 50 to 52 percent reductions by 2030. Very exciting thing to come forward. It really spurred on COP26 last year. When we saw the United States come back into the Paris Agreement and put out an ambitious new NDC, it wasn't a surprise to also see China come and provide more information and kind of an upgrade to their NDC. Canada came out with a new one. Uh, Japan came out with a new one. EU was right about within a week of that. None of this was on accident. All of the countries that are doing this and we need to reduce the emissions globally are doing it together because nobody likes to go out there and be alone and you know have the you know different uh, constituency as a home say, well, what about this other country? Why aren't they doing it? We don't want to go along. So building it up together and building trust is extremely important. If you look at the chart, you know, coming out of the, uh, the United Nations, I think environmental program, climate action tracker, but UNEP did this graph, I think last year, we see the different wedges coming in. All these different countries coming forward with different amounts in their NDCs is going to start to bend the curve globally, getting us towards that two degrees for 1.5 degrees Celsius um, that is needed to actually make it. Um, the third bullet point here on this slide, is when we look at the pledges that came forward, the new NDCs last year, we had previously before those pledges been at a trajectory of looking at 3.7 degrees Celsius um, since pre-industrial times. Um, with all these new pledges, it bent the curve and brought us back to 2.4. Obviously not enough, but it starts bringing us back to where we need to be and where we need to start pointing. Now, this is if all the targets are fully implemented. So what do we need in the future? We need better pledges. We need more pledges, but we also need to implement the pledges. Um, what are we going at this year? Well, not just NDCs that are looking at a five-year cycle, but we're also looking at 2050 net zero pathways. Last year, we saw 70% of global emissions for 130 countries were covered under net zero pledges. This year, we've had a couple different major economies come forward as well. So all of a sudden, we have 90% of global emissions are now under these net zero pathways. Now, net zero is not possible without natural climate solutions. If you're not absorbing and improving your country's national sink and emission, reducing your emissions at the same time, you're never gonna get to that zero. Um, we have a chance to move forward on this. We have a whole bunch of um, new momentum also built. The United States passing the IRA the other month was extremely important. Many times in the UNFCCC negotiations, many countries will actually question the United States. You know, the, in the first NDC, how are you going to make that 26 to 28 percent pledge? In the second NDC, how are you going to meet that 50 to 52 percent pledge? Well, now we have legislation, we have budget. All of a sudden, this enhances the United States' ability to negotiate and make sure that other countries are coming forward as well. Canada all of a sudden passes a new budget. Again, it helps as well because all these different countries, seeing that there's chances to make the different NDCs, means that we have that chance to walk forward together again. Lastly, um, talk a little bit about finance. This is a little bit less about the United States implementing its pledge, but how do we start to look at foreign assistance budgets? Last year, um, we saw we fell short um, in COP15 in 2009 in Copenhagen. There was a pledge 
to support developing countries from both public and private finance of a, up to her basically of a hundred billion dollars per year by 2020. Obviously we didn't make it by 2020. We didn't make it last year either, but we were at about 85 million last year. We're probably around 95 billion this year. Sorry, I, I said million, but I meant billion. So we're, we're almost to that hundred billion. But if you look at these different colors in this uh, projection, take a look, the bottom is public uh, bilateral public funds. So from USAID to another country or something like that. The middle blue is multilateral development banks, mostly from public funding as well. The pink on the top is the private sector. So if you look at that 2019 year, you start to see for every about $3 of public funding, we're leveraging $1 of private sector funding. I think what we really need to do is we know public budgets are always going to be under pressure. There's many different competing needs. How do we flip this? How do we make sure that we start to use different financial products and use public sector funding even smarter? How do we use you know, development finance corporations' ability to de-risk loans to mean that the private sector can then come in and improve and make that pink bar much, much larger, get us to the pledges that are needed and the amount of finance that are needed internationally? Now, um, others are going to talk a little bit more about the, the agriculture, the forest, and the wetlands perspectives here. But last year with COP26, we saw all sorts of different financial and political pledges. They can talk a little bit more about some of these, but one thing I'd like to point out is pledges aren't always going to help. We need the pledges to be met. So as budgets start to move, we start to get funding into the and onto the ground is where we actually start to see the action. Now, a couple last things that uh, we're focusing on going into COP is we know that there's going to be African leadership with Egypt being the COP president. We know that there's going to be a very strong on climate adaptation and that $100 billion finance pledge. So a couple of questions to focus on is how are we going to pay for that? You know, one idea I just mentioned is flipping that public for a private sector a wedge of public finance to private finance. How can countries and private sector organizations meet their own pledges? Make sure we really are getting to net zero. And then lastly, how do we make climate action more equitable, both at a domestic context and internationally? With that, I'm going to stop. Thank you all very much um, for this opportunity, and I'll pass it back to you, Dan. John, thank you so much. Um, you presented some great slides, just as a reminder to everyone in our audience, um, the slides that John presented, the slides that our other panelists will present, everything will be available online at www.esi.org. Uh, also, the archived webcast, so if you'd like to go back and revisit any of John's presentation or any of the rest of the briefing today, you can do that. And after a little bit of time, we'll have written summary notes available online, too, to help you skim through uh, and find the information from the different presentations. So thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Our second panelist is Trey Lord. Trey is the Senior Technical Manager for 1T.org US and American Forests. That's a global initiative to catalyze the conservation, restoration, and growth of a trillion trees by 2030 in partnership with the public, private, and civil society sectors. In this role, Trey leads the 1T.org US Community of Practice Working Groups and provides technical expertise in research and implementation of these natural climate solutions, and particularly internationally. Prior to this, he held positions and consultancies with a number of U.S. Agency for International Development contractors and environmental organizations, mostly focused on Red Plus, Indigenous Peoples Engagement, Climate Smart Agriculture, and Sustainable Development. He's lived and worked in multiple countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and he's with us today. Trey, it's great to see you. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Daniel. Um, all right, so let's just fire off here. Let me share my, uh, share my screen, and we're going. Is everyone able to see that? Okay, great. Uh, all right. So first and foremost, um, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to be addressing um, forests and uh, forests as, as as they relate to climate change and at COP uh, COP 27. Um, so forests play an integral role um, in everyone's lives and, and in human experience. Um, they are essential in our own personal narratives. Um, for those who are fortunate enough, you can probably look out your window right now and see see some see a tr at least one tree with some beautiful fall colors. They are paramount uh, part of our cities, our states, our leisure time. Uh, they're, they're important in our economy. They're important in our history. They're important in our future, um, and perhaps most importantly, they for our, for that future in our climate. Um, forests play a natural or a natural climate solution um, in removing carbon from the atmosphere, um, as I'm sure most of you know, um, 
from from uh, from child from uh, high school science classes how they absorb CO two, store that carbon, um, and uh, to to grow and uh, and so here's some here's some basic numbers on on the roles that they play in climate change. Um, forests themselves um, are roughly about uh, seventy to uh, hundred billion dollars uh, provide about seventy five seventy five to hundred billion dollars annually. In uh, in values of goods and services, um, but they also um, contribute significantly to uh, to uh, conserving or to uh, sequestering and absorbing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but uh, they are, they also can be a a uh, a source of emissions. Um, roughly about uh, depending on how you calculate it, roughly about twenty percent of global emissions come from deforestation, forest degradation annually. Um, they they however as they can be a, a, a positive uh, means of absorb a positive natural climate solution they can uh, they currently are uh, currently can absorb about 15 percent of uh, fuel emissions um, in the united states um fossil fuel emissions annually um but they also have the potential um through means of some of the actions i'll describe in a bit to uh to uh, mitigate against climate change, roughly about 27 percent of, of current emission, current U.S. emissions can be absorbed um, by by forests and by trees. Um, globally, um, when we, when we uh, scan out, they can roughly be about 30 percent of the uh, absorption uh, of global climate of global greenhouse gas emissions. However, they are only uh, they only account for uh, activities around for the conservation restoration of forests only account for three percent. Of the share of global climate change mitigation. Um, again, one of the main reasons why force is so important is not only is their their ability to uh, to act as a, a sink and absorb uh, greenhouse gas emiss greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, they also can be uh, when when not conserved, they are an irrevocable irrevocable um, uh, source of carbon for for uh, as uh, as emissions. So here's a here's a graph to kind of demonstrate that if as you uh, as you deforest as you as forests are degraded, um, they are a source that cannot the source of carbon that cannot be uh, cannot be recaptured, um, and and again some of the some of the sources for deforestation some of the drives of deforestation are primarily uh, through agricultural and agricultural frontiers, roughly to the tune of about um, 861 gigatons of carbon. Uh, um, um equivalent to uh, annually equivalent to roughly the the net worth of uh of uh, nearly a century's worth of fossil fuel emissions at the, at the current rate um and again some of the major drivers of this are being agriculture mostly in um agriculture frontiers and the Democratic agriculture congo indonesia and brazil and mostly in cattle farming palm oil soy cocoa um rubber and coffee um and again that's not a, that's an issue uh, domestically but it's also an issue abroad um in in our uh our agricultural commodity chains and our consumption and we have our own drivers of deforestation as well domestically being uh forest fires development um blight and and some pet and pests such as uh be uh, the certain kinds of uh of, of beetles and and so on um here's again uh oh, sorry. uh Here's a, a graph that uh, John showed us a minute ago. Here's that represents some of the, uh, the, the the potential for mitigation of climate change. Um, again, reforestation being the largest uh, largest opportunity for uh, for sequestering and absorbing more carbon as trees grow um, in previously deforested land. Um, again, then there's some other uh, means of uh, mitigating climate change, such as avoiding uh, forest co uh, conversion. Um, improved and uh, natural forest mitigation, improved uh, plantations with agroforestry, and then avoided wood fuels, fire management, and so on, activities such as that. Um, but broadly speaking, the uh, the best uh, opportunities for action uh, for, to mitigate against climate change is to um, and, and actions we can take to conserve and restore and grow forests are through combating deforestation, forest degradation, restoring forest landscapes, enabling uh, uh, rights-based land use, and unlocking the benefits of uh, economic benefits and social benefits from uh, from forest conservation. 
Um, forests, again, also play a, a very important role in climate, in climate adaptation along with mitigation. Here's a graphic that kind of shows some of the, the various um, natural climate solutions that my colleagues will discuss later, but specifically in forests, they play an important role in mitigating against forest fires. They, uh, they, they play a role in mitigate, mitigating against flooding. Um, and in coastal regions, they mitigate against some storm surge issues and uh, the same going with uh, riparian buffer zones, so along rivers or along lakes. These are some of the paramount issues that you may that you may be thinking of recently with extreme weather events such as forest fires, hurricanes, flooding, and so on. So forests play an important role and uh, can, if restoring, by restoring our forests, we can help mitigate against some of these losses and not have to do so in more costly means such as uh dams and uh storm uh, storm bears and things like that um so i i would first like to uh like to highlight and, and uh and applaud some of the action that's been going on um domestically this has been the most significant uh year this past year has been the most significant and impactful year for force and climate in our nation's history um and, and uh i'd like to highlight the bipartisan uh, infrastructure laws was uh, you got the ball rolling initially, and uh, here's some numbers for uh, the Plant Act under that. Um, second major piece of uh, legislature or piece of action was uh, President Biden's Earth Day executive order. And then most recently, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, my, my, uh, my team at American Force um, has uh, been, been uh, very involved in getting these, uh, getting some of this uh, legislation across the line. And, uh, and and helping uh, design some of the, the ways that these uh, this funding will be going forward. But um, chief and uh, chief and uh, and principally the the two main areas I'd like to highlight is and, uh, and applaud is the uh, the 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 money that's been appropriated for urban and community forestry um, that will go a long way towards addressing some of the uh, the uh, the lack of forest and the lack of access to forests that uh, that marginalized communities have in urban areas. And the effects of, of not having those, such as heat island effects, um, which is uh, which is significant for some of these communities. And then beyond that, some of the, some of the uh, funding that has gone to uh, restoring forests, the mitigate mitigate against forest fire risk. Um, again, and and in doing so, help building um, some uh, action at, at the state, at the state and local levels towards um, small businesses, for nurseries, and uh, for replanting and so on. So I'd like to thank you all for. Uh, for getting that this legislation passed and, and doing so in a, in, in a bipartisan way. Um, so again, then moving from there to uh, to looking at the international perspective. So uh, the at, at the in the UNFCCC at the UN uh, these UN negotiations, force has been force have been uh, on the agenda and have been a major part of these negotiations for uh, since roughly around uh, 2007, but, um, when force were formally put on the agenda. Um, with the leadership of Papua New Guinea and uh, some of my uh, former colleagues and bosses at Environmental Defense Fund. Um, there they were put up, um, it was brought on as the, in the Bali roadmap and then has been advancing since then through the Cancun Agreement in 2010, um, through the Warsaw Framework for Red in, uh, in, uh, in 2013 and, and it's been advancing since. And if you're looking for how this, uh, this the framework, um, how this will be taking, taking shape in, in the, as far as forests go in this venue, it's really in this acronym REDD, Red Plus. Um, and that stands for reducing emissions from deforestation de and forest degradation. And then, uh, and plus is is uh, other activities that can contribute to this um, in co as uh, through conservation, sustainable forest management, and enhance, uh, enhancing forest carbon stocks. And roughly speaking, I won't go too, into too many of the details, but it is a, a framework to build, uh, build towards um, moving of uh, uh, results-based finance, such as carbon markets and other types of Overseas development assistance um, towards uh, empowering local communities and local forest and uh, and uh, force and countries that have uh, significant forests, such as Brazil and the Amazonian countries. The uh, same with the Congo, Indonesia, and so on. Um, towards uh, towards building and enhanced capacity to um, to keep their forest standing, to enhance the, the forest carbon stocks, and to empower these local communities to do so with results-based finance. And even in a phased approach to get to those results-based finance, there's many steps towards building capacity and, and seeking um, investment from the public sector, private sector, and uh, and it's, it's something to keep an eye out for in, in, the, in the UN negotiations. So moving on from there, the big successes uh, last year at uh, in Glasgow, have kind of taken up kind of the, uh, for lack of a better term, the oxygen 
um, for why Forrest won't be at kind of the, in the tops uh, on the t on the primary stage in uh, at COP27. But but uh, again, that's it, it's kind of due to the success of these negotiations have happened. So in Glasgow, 140 countries um, signed on to the Glasgow Declarations on uh, Forest and Land Use, and uh, those 140 countries um, account for roughly about 90.4% um, of the forests global force um, are covered by this uh, by this by this agreement and which is um, in, in a couple of different ways these countries have pledged to conserve and uh, conserve and restore force um, going forward and in doing so look um, not only at um, how they can do it um, at the UN in a forum such as the UN, but also doing so at the G7, at the World, with the World Economic Forum, and within the halls of Congress in other countries' ministries, at at state houses, in boardrooms, um, and and within our not in our own personal consumptions and spending decisions. So looking not only at national action, state level action on how to get for to slow deforestation and, and land degradation, but also looking at how we can improve supply chains improve um, and, and create incentives for zero deforestation supply chains, looking at means uh, through through legislature and, and other innovative uh, ways of leveraging the private sector to, to look at how we can do sustainable land use, looking at biodiversity and other climate goals. Along with that in, in Glasgow, they also pledged um, to put forward $19.2 billion to help protect and restore glo forests globally by 2025. Um, and again, the U.S. is a part of this, and uh, so we have a lot to get going as far as this funding and these actions. So the U.S. specifically, um, that the action that was taken since then um, was the releasing the Plan to Conserve Global Force at Critical Carbon Sink, which came out earlier this year, um, at, the, at the beginning of this year. In, in that, um, a couple of uh, objectives were, were uh, put forward, um, specifically to incentivize forests and ecosystem conservation, and restore forest landscapes, um, finding ways to catalyze the private sector and finance from the private sector to conserve these, these global carbon sinks, um, to build long-term capacity, both domestically and internationally, to, uh, to, to do so. And then also then to increase the, increase the ambition of not only our own government, but our state level governments and then other governments abroad. So finding ways to leverage our action um, towards moving that forward. And in doing so, um, they pledged to put forward the U.S. government has pledged to put forward up to nine billion dollars of international climate, fine, uh, climate funding to support these actions, and that mostly be uh, be led by um, and be appropriated through agencies such as USAID, uh, um, the State Department, the U.S. Forest Service, international programs, but also in uh, in smaller agencies such as the MCC, um, the Development Finance uh, Corporation, so on, and then also to multilateral, so funding going to the World Bank, um, to the UN, and then to some to regional development banks such as the Inter, Inter American Development Bank. Um, so these are important actions to get things going, and uh, and I would uh, encourage everyone to to help see help see this through. Um, so again, an important part of that, which I mentioned, um, is um, getting that the the State Department and the the U.S. government has identified is getting is finding ways to catalyze the private sector to to engage on these issues. Um, this is paramount as we as you know our budget as federal government budgets and state level government budgets and and also internationally are always are always falling uh, are always money is short. So we need to find innovative ways to to not only leverage the funding that can come from the private sector, but also to, to encourage and catalyze action within their own supply chains. So a couple of ways um, that, that for this to happen is um, that which we at uh, 1T.org and also with American Forest and broadly within the environmental community is to look for finding sustainable forestry standards um, and zero deforestation supply chains. There's many ways to do this and we encourage you to, to, uh, to look, look into how, how to take action and reach out to us or some of my colleagues on how to do that. And then um, finding, uh, uh, catalyzing large scale investments for direct finance or, or finding uh, market-based mechanisms for, um, for financing such as carbon credits and there are also crediting systems that can go beyond those, such as biodiversity credits, which are in the uh, kind of the exploratory stage at this point. And then um, again, finding public-private partnerships at the national level, international, state level, city level, and so on. Finding ways to leverage those public-private partnerships um, to to bring uh, to do this, and that can be in a number of ways of either matching funds, innovative 
uh, partnership schemes um, or finding ways to, for governments to de-risk um, private sector investments towards sustainable commodity chains um, and sustainable production. And uh, we encourage those, those work streams um, at the UN and at other various venues and finding those uh, means of uh, of uh, moving beyond unsustainable risk, uh, unsustainable uh, business models and land use practices, um, which uh, the, the private sector can can go. And in, and in that same vein, I would encourage everyone to then to look at uh, organizations such as my own, 1T.org US. Um, and we're, and that is exactly what we do is to find, um, is to, to leverage the private sector um, and uh, sorry, and the leverage the private sector and moving forward in, in doing so. So specifically at COP this year, um, uh, we would look to um, we would look to to kind of help fulfill the the Glasgow Declaration on Forest and Land Use, and to help meet those uh, those pledges uh, for climate finance. Again, that was nineteen point two billion that that uh, the OECD countries of the of uh, of the uh, the 140 countries from the Glasgow Declaration have signed on to have pledged at $19.2 billion by 2025. And so we really have to get going to meet those pledges. And we also have to get uh, get policy uh, agendas forward to to meet the the uh, goals of the, the Glasgow Declaration for some land use. So meeting those and raising ambitions beyond that, um, these some of these actions, is, and especially the importance of force for not only mitigating against climate, but also potentially being Potentially exacerbating climate further if we if we continue to cut them, burn them, or or convert them um, at at the current rate, and if we continue to support support uh, supply chains that do so as well. Um, so again, leveraging the private sector um, to play a key role in this action and to financing uh, zero deforestation forest positive action is important. Um, and then finding those finding those cost effective and equitable uh, natural climate solutions will help uh, move our agendas forward not only in mitigating against climate but also in some of our our broader uh, sustainable development goals uh, uh, internationally. So again, like I mentioned before, um, I would encourage everyone to to check out um, initiatives such as One T at Org US. Um, we are a convening organization, um, convening body. Uh, where we, and we work with everyone from the girl step from from the federal government to the girl scouts and we're a movement um working hand in hand with federal state and local governments to leverage uh leverage um leverage uh, capacity expertise finance and action um threading together the public and private sector and ngos towards um finding multi-sectoral approaches for addressing um, climate change by conserving, restoring, and growing a trillion trees by 2030. Um, and so we would engage everyone to, to come and check us out. Um, we, we've been working closely and to build this movement um, with bipartisan stakeholders on the Hill um, and within the administration, as well as in state houses and local governments to, to, uh, to engage action. Um, everywhere from planting trees locally in, in uh, planting trees in urban centers, um, reforesting uh, reforesting areas that have been uh, that have been uh, cleared out from forest fires, but also looking at how to improve uh, again those sustainable and zero deforestation supply chains going forward. Um, so I uh, would like to thank you for uh, for having me, and I uh, I look forward to to speaking with everyone further. So please uh, check us out, and uh, thanks. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thanks, Trey. That was a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, as a reminder to our online audience today, uh, we are taking questions. Um, you have two options to send us questions. And actually, there's a bunch coming in, so it's really exciting. We'll do our best to incorporate them into the Q&A. Um, you can send us an email. The email address to use is ask at a, no, wait, ask at eesi.org. That's A-S-K at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at eesi online. Um, our third panelist is Courtney Durham. Courtney leads Pew's engagement in United Nations negotiations on climate change and supports efforts to incorporate and strengthen climate considerations in Pew's conservation projects. Courtney's previous work at Pew included authoring or co-authoring numerous articles on protecting coastal wetlands and co coral reefs in Central America and finding nature-based solutions to rebuild economies after the COVID-19 pandemic. Before joining Pew in 2019, Courtney worked on global climate policy with the World Resources Institute, the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, and the G German Development Corporation. Courtney, welcome to our briefing today. That's a great looking first slide. I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of them too. 
Thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. I'm Courtney Durham. I work for the Pew Charitable Trust on conservation and climate. This is my ninth consecutive COP, and I find myself um, strangely maybe still in love with the, the whole UNFCCC process. So <clears throat> I'm excited to be here with you today to talk through some of the blue uh, elements of this upcoming COP27. So ocean and coastal issues really have had um, burgeoning amount of interest in the last five or so years. Chile and the UK, the most recent climate COP presidencies, put a lot of political support on bluing the, the COP per se. And we know there's certainly going to be some activity on these issues um, at COP27 in Egypt. So what I'm going to try to do today is, is walk through some ocean, ocean and coastal um, solutions, describe how they're considered during COPs. Um, we'll walk through a concept called blue carbon, um, underscore how it's uniquely situated for policymakers, and then we'll spend a bit of time looking through some concrete examples about how policymakers are currently using um, wetlands in their, their climate um, priorities. So oceans, um, first off, just as you've heard from Trey and we'll hear um, on agriculture in a bit, terrestrial ecosystems play a significant role in stabilizing our planet, but so too do our oceans and coasts. They are massively influential um, in our planet's carbon cycle, having long maintained balance, constant exchange um, with our atmosphere, thinking about um, the oceans absorbing 90% of excess heat, 40% uh, of CO2 emissions. Um, but as these emissions continue to rise, the capacity of the ocean to um, continue to play that stabilization role is, is in jeopardy. But we shouldn't, um, I'd be remiss in just conceptualizing our ocean and coast um, as falling victim. They are of course also a place um, to turn to for solutions. Now, on one hand, I have here, they're, they're useful for both mitigation and adaptation. On one hand, adaptation. Ocean climate solutions can help people and nature facing the impacts of climate change right now, meaning they help to adapt against those impacts with benefits um, like shoreline stabilization, water filtration, livelihoods, um, et cetera. On the mitigation side of this climate coin, coastal ecosystems, those places where the ocean uh, meets the land are special because they provide those adaptation benefits, but also they help mitigate against um, emissions at disproportionately high rates, I'd say, compared to other, other habitats. So that's why we're going to spend some time focusing on, on these coastal areas um, in, the next, in the next few slides. I should say, science um, tells us that the ocean, a healthy ocean can contribute up to 21% of the emissions reductions needed to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. And that's that's huge. That's a fifth of the potential. Um, we can look to the ocean for that. And this can be achieved with both technical solutions, things like um, decarbonizing shipping, expanding offshore renewables, but also it includes um, in that pathway, um, nature-based solutions like protecting coastal wetlands habitats. And um, I, I do have to say that, you know, the best overall solution for the ocean is to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That, that is the, the best thing that we can do for the ocean truly. But while we are working to decarbonize um, trickier sectors like transport, like buildings, um, we can utilize natural climate solutions today. So um, let's walk through a little bit of what, uh, what our coasts are able to, to provide for us. So here I have what is blue carbon, right? When we think of natural climate solutions utilizing our oceans and coasts, the real, real powerhouse ecosystems are coastal wetlands. And these coastal wetlands are commonly referred to as blue carbon ecosystems um, because they're really good at keep, keeping, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, keeping it in their soils for a very, very long amount of time. Um, Coastal wetlands are salt marshes, they are mangroves, and they are seagrass meadows. So those three are amongst the most productive and sometimes most threatened ecosystems on the planet. And those three together are what we refer to as blue carbon ecosystems. And again, what, what makes them especially interesting for, for policymakers is the fact that they can, they can store more carbon per equivalent area than many, many other habitats and provide at the same time numerous other climate um, related benefits to people, people and nature. So really it's, it's a pretty significant bang for your buck in a relatively small um, land use area. Um, now, important caveat here on blue carbon, right? So these coastal wetlands, those three places, um, those three ecosystem types, 
they have internationally recognized science and guidance from the United Nations, guidance from the US EPA about how to count the carbon in those, those three habitats. This makes them actionable in a sense for policymakers uh, looking to reduce their emissions with the help of nature. All other marine ecosystems, those beyond our coasts, um, do not yet have this level of scientific rigor um, and certainty. So right now they haven't been approved ecosystems for, for by the UN for carbon accounting, but um, we can and still see policymakers stressing the adaptation importance of those places while uh, the mitigation value is, is sort of further explored in the, in the years to come. So I'm going to I'm going to walk us through a bit about how are we seeing blue carbon crop up at various policy levels, right? We're starting to see a trend emerging, leaders realizing that protecting and restoring wetlands can be a critical natural climate solution um, amongst a variety of, of tools in their toolbox. Um, one that policymakers at all levels, really from subnational to, to national and international, can can leverage in support of their their climate goals. So I'm going to walk us through um, starting at the subnational level th up to the zooming out to the international. Um, some some concrete examples for you. So subnational. Let's start with a, a subnational actor pulling their weight on climate action. Um, that would be Oregon. Oregon's updated climate plan is is one of the first in the U.S. to account for blue carbon benefits of coastal habitats. And their their state strategy, how they did it, um, can serve as a, a blueprint for for other states that are looking to leverage um, those ecosystems in their their climate plans. Pew supported this work, helping the state establish a, a greenhouse, greenhouse gas inventory, what it's called. It's basically a, um, a snapshot in time of the carbon in those wetlands so that the state was able to realize, you know, wow, this is an ecosystem that's a carbon sink for us, meaning it's helping to take out more carbon than it's emitting. So we should really protect and restore this place, uh, these habitats, because it's going to um, aid us in meeting our statewide climate goal for 2030. So. Um, as, as many of us know here, you know, state action does matter for domestic uh, emissions reduction. So it's promising to see um, subnational actors also stepping up to the plate with blue carbon. Um, at the national level, action on blue carbon, let's look at the, the USNDC um, and recent congressional action that we've been speaking about. Um, as many of you know, the Biden administration submitted a new NDC, a new climate target for the US um, to achieve a 50 to 52% um, reduction of emissions by 2030. And in the text of this NDC, which I put up on, on the slide here, there's a specific nod to how blue carbon ecosystems can be part of that pathway. And that, that is a, a useful signal to send out to the international level, underscoring the role that nature will play in getting us there alongside the other important emissions reductions that we'll need to be doing across our economy. The NDC also does the same for our friends in the, in the forestry, forestry and agricultural sectors. And then also, you know, following that stated ambition from the administration in the in the NDC itself, there's been all of that exciting movement for implementation with funding um, to realize this nationwide climate goal. Both IJA and IRA have billions in funding for for coastal um, and marine based solutions, which will help us prioritize the, the sorts of protections and restoration activities um, that will aid us in, in reaching this this 2030 goal. And as John said in in the opening, that really puts the US in a strong position at COP27. This momentum at home will really um, help to speak volumes in the, in the negotiations, trying to, to sort of ramp up ambition from, from other world actors. And then internationally, I wanted to, to nod, um, obviously we're not the only ones working on this, of course. The US is part of a, a group of 71 countries um, that included ocean-based measures in their updated climate goals, their NDCs under the Paris Agreement. And that's great to see really this groundswell of, of recognition um, at the international level about the, the role that, that natural climate solutions, uh, marine and, and coastal can be playing. And with, you know, with adequate climate finance and, and capacity building, it would be great to see all 151 countries that have coasts um, recognize the role that, that ocean-based ocean climate policy can play. Um, but progress has been notable and, and sustained since the, the 2015 Paris Agreement. Um, so it's good to see those, those 71 countries reflecting that. One of those countries, Seychelles, the island nation, for example, committed to protecting um, rather impressively 50% of its seagrass and mangrove habitats by 2025 and 100% by 2030. Um, Pew was working closely with, with the government of Seychelles um, to advance the research necessary to deliver on this um, commitment and will be um, showcasing that work at, at COP27. 
So with all of this said, I'm, I'm trying to make clear that that leaders at all levels, right, can and have been harnessing the the power of these blue carbon uh, coastal wetland ecosystems to help address their 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 climate ambitions. And and COP27 is one of those very useful stages where um, they can seek to sort of amplify that that action. And then lastly here, I'm just going to walk us through quickly some expectations on the ocean climate nexus at COP27 to be aware of. Um, so like I said, countries will be there to showcase what they're doing at home. Um, we expect several statements and signals of future ambition um, on ocean climate solutions from head of states um, to be made in the first two days of COP during that World Leaders Summit, so keep an eye out there. Um, we're also hoping to see progress on um, ocean and coastal considerations being included in what's known as the global stock take process. This is basically just a, a, a periodic progress report that countries um, will have to discuss how they're doing in meeting their climate goals um, every, free, every few years. So it's, it's gonna be useful um, because natural climate solutions are part of that equation. You'd really want to see um, lessons learned shared widely in this fora. Um, going forward. So we'll, we'll be looking to get um, Oceans and Coasts Incorporated in that process. It's also been a bit of a um, newcomer on the ocean climate dialogue, we call it. It's a, it's a new process at the UNFCCC that will now take place every year, every June going forward. And on the, the heels of a very successful first um, session this last June in Germany, um, you could imagine that the Egyptian presidency um, would reflect the outcome from that session in its COP decision text in the, the end negotiating um, recap that would be useful to see. And we do know of you know, over 40 ocean and coastal side events that'll be happening alongside the negotiations throughout the two weeks. Happy to share info on those, those pieces to whomever. And of course, um, you'd expect to see announcements of new funding and initiatives launched um, at COP, but I, I, uh, I won't spill any teasers on that front. Um, yeah, so that's that's my talk. Um, ocean climate nexus, especially ripe for for policy action, and we're looking forward to see how things how things unfold at at COP twenty seven in Egypt. Thank you, Courtney. Um, that last slide that you presented had a whole bunch of things to look ahead to. Um, a great way for our audience to keep track of all of those announcements is to sign up for our uh, daily newsletter during COP twenty seven. Um, COP27 dispatch. Um, we'll also be uh, compiling announcements um, as well to help uh, keep track of all of the, the different um, the different goings on uh, over in Egypt. Uh, and we'll be making those available for free online, just like all of our other resources uh, as the negotiations progress. Um, also, if anyone in our audience would like to go back and revisit Courtney's slides or the other slides from today or, or rewatch, everything is available or will be soon available uh, online at www.esi.org. I'd like to introduce our fourth and final panelist for today. Uh, Brett Grusman is the Vice President of Climate Smart Agriculture at Environmental Defense Fund, where she helps create environmentally effective and economically sound solutions for working landscapes, including farms, ranches, and forests. Her experience spans from reaching deforestation in Brazil, reducing deforestation in Brazil to supporting low carbon rural development in India. Previously in her career, Britt served as EDF's first European Union director in London, focusing on fisheries reform. She's an economist recognized for her wide ranging expertise in environmental policy and most notably climate and conservation policy. Britt, welcome. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. And it's always a little bit daunting uh, speaking as the last one uh, because all your other colleagues have been giving such amazing presentations already. So thank you, John, for a fantastic um, um, sort of really good overview of, of what we're really trying to do at the COP and why, and obviously uh, Trey and Courtney uh, for your uh, deep dives. So I am also going to try and um, share some slides. And I do say try, because that's always a little tricky. Um, I hope that these work. Um, and I think I can't actually see anybody else. So if they don't work, somebody will have to come off mute to let me know. Um, and they, look they look good? Yep, we can see them. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much. So, um, so yes, so the, the, the question um, I was asked was to talk about sort of um, agriculture and climate smart agriculture in the in this uh, conversation. And um, 
the US situation and then COP27. And the first thing to really say is finally, finally, we are talking about climate and agriculture in the same context. Uh, finally, we're talking about agriculture at the same time as, as, as forests and oceans. Um, it's notable that this is COP27, so 27 COPs, 27 years, and that um, this is going to be the first time that there's going to be an official pavilion that will be looking at food and agriculture, um, which I think is going to be run uh, by the UN with, with FAO. And that's really quite notable. And having worked in the field of um, climate change for a long time, it's really not that surprising. Agriculture has for the longest time been the third rail when it comes to discussing um, climate policies, um, just considered too hard, too many diverse stakeholders, politically very controversial, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what we're now seeing is that we're in a different time. Um, first of all, farmers and agriculture, they are literally at the forefront of the impacts. It doesn't matter whether you live in the US or in Kenya or in India. Um, if you're a farmer, you rely on weather, you rely on um, temperature, availability of water, absence of big weather events, etc, to, to literally be able to grow the food that is your business, that is your income. So it's really, really important that agriculture and climate get looked at um, for the adaptation side. Now, for the mitigation side, um, we know that agriculture, for instance, in the US is estimated to be about 10% of emissions. Um, however, if you look globally and you include um, those parts of deforestation that are led by clearing forests for agriculture, it very quickly jumps to 30%, so about a third. So it is a really, really important sector. Um, as we are looking at a growing population uh, that we need to feed, we need to um, make sure that we do that um, in an as efficient way as possible. So we'll need to grow more food. We'll also need to ensure that the food we grow isn't wasted. It's always very distressing to read that about a third of all the food that is produced in the world never actually makes it into anybody's mouth or belly uh, because it either gets wasted um, during the um, transportation process or others or people like me wasted in our fridge so there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done in this space if we want to really address that as well now i know most of you um are in the US, and this is a congressional uh, staffing presentation, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what the US is doing. Um, again, I've been working in the climate field for a long time. I was actually first started working at Environment Defense Fund uh, when we were looking at Waxman Markey, the first hope for a federal bill back in 2008. Um, and at that time, the agriculture uh, sector was not very supportive of uh, that policy. And that's probably the understatement of the century. Um, now we're in a very different situation. Back in 2020, um, Environmental Defense Fund with the Farm Bureau, the National Farmers Union, and the National Council of Farmers Corporation um, got together to um, have a coalition that's called the Food and Agricultural Climate Alliance, we call it FACA for short, um, that has since grown uh, to include many other groups, including uh, TNC and many other farm groups. Um, what was this group was set up to discuss together policies for food and agriculture sector on climate, climate policies, food and agriculture sector, you know, unheard of, would have been unheard of um, 10 years ago, even just three years ago. Now, the times are changing, and we've seen that this year very much um, with um, the Biden administration's um, regulations. So I want to thank everybody who is online, who has been part, big or small, um, to the two um, pieces of policy that I've got here on the screen, the Inflation Reduction Act, which sets aside about 20 billion for the agricultural sector, and the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities, which at the moment has assigned about 2.8 billion, but we expect that to go over 3 billion when the smaller projects get announced. That's a lot of money that this administration is rightly um, investing into Climate Smart Ag in this country. Um, I can go into 
more details of exactly what that will look at. Many of you will know this very well and also happy to answer some of those questions, questions you may have around this in, in the, in the Q&A later. Um, but I wanted to bring this up because, um, as I think John and Courtney alluded to, when you show up as a country delegate to the COP, you need to bring the goods. You can't just be demanding other countries um, bring make big um, uh, declarations and targets and not be able to back that up yourself. So having these investments is showing that um, showing the world that the US believes in the importance of the climate sector uh, of the for um, agriculture sector for fighting climate. Sorry, I knew I was going to blub at some point. Um, so here we are from national to global ambition. So US has kind of really sort of Put a line in the sand and show this is what we think we think the agricultural sector is really important um, for fighting climate change and we're putting our money where our mouth is what does that mean when you go to sharm el sheikh well one of the things that um i think your uh, the government will be talking about is is methane um i was just looking um, on twitter earlier today and um there is a, a great um uh feed by climate news that is looking at what are the different heads of state and the different um foreign ministers state departments going to be talking about and how can we therefore define the people and john Kerry was referred to as uh the methane solver or the methane implementer um the methane pledge was signed last year um it's a big priority for um the u.s government um and the many parties that have signed it so far and um yes methane matters um methane um is a um very potent um greenhouse gas so if you look at it over a 20-year greenhouse warming potential, um, methane is one of the most important gases. gases. Um, this graph here shows that if we take ambitious action only on CO2, then you have the sort of the lighter blue, which you see peaks and then slowly goes down. If we take ambition, ambitious action and include methane now, we can peak earlier and um and sort of the the tail end will also be flatter so it's really really important that we focus on that so i was really happy to see uh that john kerry will be the sort of um state department representative known as as methane um about 40 percent of methane comes from the agricultural sector um it comes from um cow burps cow manure and rice rice fields this is really important um to address this now we know that climate impacts are already here so i'm talking a bit about mitigation um, most of the um, ira funds are for climate mitigation um, but climate impacts are already here and we're not just talking about other regions we're also talking about the us edf um, last week at world food price we launched a new report that um, by 2030 climate change will significantly impact the um, big commodities that we are growing in this country our analysis looked at um, soybeans in minnesota corn in iowa and uh, wheat in kansas and found some significant um, reductions of productivity. Now, the, the thing to really understand uh, with these effects is that they're going to be very locally felt. So our analysis looked at um, a very small scale of about 4,000 acres and saw that within one state, there will be winners and losers. There will be those whose productivity actually improves because of climate change, but um, those where it will um, reduce. And on balance, there will be a sort of a reduction. So not only is it important that the US and other countries invest in climate mitigation because yes we do need to um, bend the curve on the emissions and keep the emissions um, below two degrees it's also really important that everybody starts investing in adaptation um, there's going to be a lot of discussions in egypt about the financial needs for adaptation in the global south they are crucial uh, but it also will be important that um, even in the us and the eu we do not lose sight of what needs to get done there 
Shrey was talking a lot about trees. And um, one of the most important things that uh, the agricultural sector will need to focus on is to avoid further land conversion for um, agriculture. As I said, the global population is increasing unless we figure out how to grow food in a more efficient way. We call it sustainable intensification. So with a low environmental footprint, but high output, we are going to see further land conversion. And that includes uh, grasslands, certain wetlands. So what Courtney was also talking about, definitely forests, and they all store a lot of carbon. And so if you really want to look at where do we get those big wins in terms of the ag sector, ensuring no further land conversion should be one of the biggest priorities and is something that um, I think they will be talking about at COP as well. So a lot of threats, but also some big opportunities. Um, talked about the methane already. Happy to talk about that some more. We, uh, our analysis showed that we would be able to get a 25% reduction in the US by 2030. Other countries can actually do more because ironically their um, beef and dairy sectors might not be as well developed, might not yet be as efficient. So there's a lot of headroom, a lot of reductions that can be had by increasing productivity. And then there's also things like nitrogen use. When we think about the emissions of the agricultural sector, methane is a big one. Uh, nitrogen use, sort of overuse of fertilizer, whatever the plant does not actually use to grow, um, gets lost either in waterways or in the air. Big opportunities to focus on that as well. Um, we'll leave you with two, um, with, you know, um, they're linked to two of our recent reports that I mentioned. One is our climate pathways that looks at what um, opportunities there are in the agricultural sector. And they are primarily those avoided conversions, agroforestry and methane. Um, and then the climate proofing agricultural uh, report that shows how the US will be affected. But I do want to sort of um, close by thanking all of those that were involved in either the IRA or the Climate Smart Partnership, um, because they are great investments in our future and in the agricultural sector. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. That was a great presentation. Um, we will now transition into a question and answer. Uh, so I'll invite uh, John and Courtney and Trey to turn on their cameras. Um, we are going to be, well, there she is. Um, to help us with the question and answers uh, today is my colleague, Anna McGinn. Um, Anna uh, has worked uh, tirelessly to put all of our COP27 briefings together, along with our policy and, and communications teams. Um, Anna and I will actually be going to Egypt next weekend, and we'll be there for the, about a little bit more than the first week. Uh, and so if anyone in our audience uh, would like to link up or, or, or um, learn more about what we're doing, I hope you'll feel free to reach out to either one of us or both. Uh, and uh, it would be great to, to touch base when we're over there. But without any further ado, Anna, I'll turn it over to you to get us started on questions and answers. Great, thanks, Dan. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I learned a ton from all of your presentations and got me even more excited about COP next week. So um, really appreciate it. And we're gonna jump right in because we have a lot of questions and a lot of questions came in from the audience. Um, the one I wanna start with is, um, you all kind of touched on the mitigation and adaptation potential of natural climate solutions, but I want to give us an opportunity to share some more of those specific examples and kind of what those really calling out what those co benefits are. So I think, John, we'll start with you and then we'll go through the order of presenters. If you could speak to kind of one of those examples and calling out some of those benefits we see on the adaptation and the mitigation side. And one other piece of it that I'll add. Um, is kind of if we saw natural climate solutions more scaled up, would that have made a difference for communities in recent kind of climate impacts that we've seen? So recent hurricanes or forest fires, how would communities have been impacted differently if we had more robust natural climate solutions in place? So John, turn it over to you first. Yeah, thanks. Great question. Um, scale is really important um, for both the adaptation and the mitigation side. Um, thinking of it um, in scale as, as far as what kind of program we build up, but also geographic scale. I mean, think of some of the work that we're doing that, you know, protects upscale watersheds and make sure that the water is coming into certain areas um, that is 
you know, making all these different natural solutions better. We have more trees, we have better uh, productivity, also reducing the risk of fire, right? And so you start to bring in all these different opportunities and it's just gonna help more and more. So we we currently have enough money and, and enough legislation to, you know, pinpoint certain places that we're gonna work. And, and if we can keep building that out larger and larger, it's gonna help so many different ways. The other piece that goes into it, you know, the resilience against wildfires, but also resilience against uh, food supply. Um, this is the United States. It's also, I mean, think about the supply shocks that are going on in Eastern Africa right now, um, along to go along with the uh, the invasion of Ukraine. All of a sudden, we're seeing wheat. Um, two of the largest wheat exporters are not exporting. COP's going to be in Egypt, where it's just the largest wheat importer. Um, we need to start building up all these resilient um, supply chains, not just for natural climate solutions, but also for and, and food production, but also for some of these political shocks. Thanks, John. Trey, we'll jump to you next. Yeah, so I mean, trees and forests in general um, have a lot of uh, have a lot of potential for not only globally as far as their their ability to absorb carbon, absorb and store carbon, which can have you know long term benefits not only for um, their sustainable means of of uh, of using stored carbon, such as in, you know sustainably harvested timber and, and, and so on as a means of long-term um, absorption and sequestration of carbon, but also on the local scale, um, local and regional scale, there's many benefits that can come um, as far as mitigation adaptation. So um, trees, for example, uh, they they create their own kind of small scale weather pattern. So if you if you look at the Sierra Nevadas, there's rain depending on which side of the which side of the, uh, the Sierra Nevadas you're looking at, and and trees just through the process of transpiration, um, they they actually create um, yeah, their own types of uh, weather patterns and can can cause rain elsewhere. Um, so that's an important uh, important role they play as far as keeping um, keeping it's kind of mitigating against their own. Um, risk for forest fires, and uh, again, so that is something that for a key, a key example out west that you might be able to see. But then, even on the on the east coast, looking at some of the issues around uh, around flooding from um, and storm surge from hurricanes. So trees are a natural uh, storm break, especially. Uh, Mr. Courtney will touch on this as well. Um, mangrove forests can can uh, can stop storms can stop storm surge, and they can also stop flooding um, upstream. So if you're looking at some of the flooding that may happen in Appalachia or in uh, in uh, Tennessee and places like that. So as flooding um, as as rain happens upstream, they can actually absorb and, and store water in the soils to stop them from flowing downstream and pulling together and causing flooding. So there's many exciting ways they can do that. Um, so it's again that that global scale of absorbing carbon, but also local scale and local benefits for uh, adapting to climate and adapting to the shocks that that are caused by climate. Great, thank you. Courtney, over to you. Oh, Courtney, I think you're muted still. There we go. Yeah, I, I will. I would also reference our, our forests on the other coast there, um, mangroves especially, um, but also salt, salt marshes and seagrass meadows in supporting um, the reduction of that impact that storms can have on, on human lives and, and ecosystems. In addition, as we've talked about, to the carbon that they can they can um, store and sequester, they, they at the same time provide habitat for fish, birds, other plants. Um, and I think a, a, an interesting example amidst all of the um, unfortunate destruction in Florida from the hurricane recently, um, mangroves that were planted along the coast um, in the Punta Gorda area, especially, um, provided significant amount of like shoreline um, buffer against storm surge, wave attenuation. Um, and so those places saw less damage than those with gray infrastructure or marinas that were unprotected, et cetera. So that's just one sort of um, pithy place to look towards, towards this happening concretely on the ground. Thank you. Britt? Yes, thank you. Well, I think my colleagues have said uh, most of the great things already. When it comes to agriculture, we you know, see a lot of opportunity in um, agroforestry. So again, trees that are on agricultural land for all the benefits that Trey's already, Trey and Courtney already men, man, uh, mentioned, including 
uh, reducing um, runoff, nutrient runoff from agricultural land, um, floods, um, etc. Um, also just avoided conversion of these native rangelands, um, wetlands and peatlands. You know, that's where the carbon is currently sequestered. So you have the mitigation right there. But they also provide you with all the, uh, the adaptation benefits um, around it in terms of you know, things that you guys have been discussing mainly sort of floods um, and then also food production, you know, healthier soils tend to provide um, better yields uh, without having to have too much um, extra fertilizer on stuff and stuff on in addition. So then you get this kind of circle where you're helping with mitigation by also becoming resilient in terms of food production. So lots of, um, you know, both sides of the coins in a lot of options. Great, thank you. Um, so we've been talking a lot about natural climate solutions in the context of COP27. That was the goal of the briefing, so that makes sense. Um, but we also have the Convention on Biological Diversity coming up in December, um, less than a month after COP27 will wrap up. So I'm curious kind of how you see biodiversity entering into the conversation at COP27, kind of in that lead up to COP15 for the Convention on Biological Diversity and kind of hope that we can also touch on for Congress specifically kind of what's important for them to think about in terms of the climate biodiversity nexus, um, especially in the context of these upcoming meetings. So Trey, maybe we can start with you and then um, we'll open up to the other panelists. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I mean, first and foremost, I mean, a biodiverse habitat is is one that's resilient. It's one that'll survive. And frankly, it's one that's it's dynamic. It's if you have, you know, everything ranging from, you know, different kinds of elephants, different kinds of of uh, those that uh, megaflora, megafauna, but all the way down to having a very biodiverse seed stock for for trees, having a, having a biodiverse range within within your forest, everything from again the animals down to the to the this is the mushrooms. So I mean, if we have the biodiversity in stock, and we're not don't have a monoculture of trees or have a monoculture of soils, if we have you know everything bacteria to again that that mega uh, the, to the dynamic animals, we'll have a, a resilient um, a resilient uh, uh, resilient habitat that can, that can survive the, the stresses and shocks from climate change. But again, it's also one that that can produce um, that can be productive and one that we can we can uh, we can pull um, we can pull resources from. So there are many examples of pulling new medicines, new types of habitats, new types of of resources for um, for pollinators from. Um, and those are that was, the uh, biodiverse habitat is also one that is that is economically uh, dynamic and one that'll help us see through, help our economy see through those, those shocks. And so as far as the, the role that it plays um, in, in both the, the COP27 in, in Egypt next month or uh, in, in November, and then also the, the, the COP in December in uh, for, for the Convention on Biological Diversity, there, it's, there, the U.S. could play key roles first, again, by making sure these habitats stay intact for biodiversity and, and for the climate conference, but then again, uh, but then uniquely at, uh, at the Convention for Biodiversity in December, and that the U.S. is the only member of the U.N. to not be signed on to this convention. Um, and it's something if, if the U.S. wants it, the biggest contribution the U.S. can can play is to, is to finally uh, sign on to the Convention for Biological Diversity and to play an active role because this uh, this COP15 is is where the uh, the post 2020 glo global bi uh, biodiversity framework will, will we anticipate will be signed, and that is will be the equivalent of the Paris Agreement for the Convention on Biological Diversity, and set the set the stage for the next 20, 30, 50 years um, for action around find for every country to to work together to create those uh, plans to conserve uh, conserve biology, biology and create strategies um, to do so across borders and even and within borders as well. Brett, let's jump to you next and then we'll go to Courtney. Thank you. Yes, I just um, wanted to sort of touch upon uh, what Trey was saying. Absolutely. It is it's very odd to me um, that the US has not signed the Convention on Biological Diversity and it is a really important important adaptive measure to have, you know, biological diversity and just to be very uh, specific, for instance, in agriculture, 
um, when we are seeing these um, climate impacts that are already happening and that will get worse no matter what we do in the next 10 years, um, we might need access to more diverse uh, crop varieties, for instance, right? So there's a lot of um, gene banks now for seeds and varieties, and that's great. But a lot of the more adaptive um, varieties may actually be indigenous uh, varieties that we have stopped um, growing and we've gone to these monocrops that will be more um, fragile to increased heats, increased pests, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to sort of touch upon that real quickly. And then of course, you know, I keep hammering on the avoided conversions, but you know, that will give you both uh, mitigation and uh, biodiversity benefits. So you can uh, hit two, two, two goals with that uh, one policy. Courtney. Yeah, I'd say maybe from a, a little bit more of a policy wonk point of view that interlinkages between the processes of CBD and UNFCCC and others um, are important, like how their respective agendas and rules can reinforce each other rather than dilute is super important. Shifting from like the traditionally siloed approaches to more integrated ones um, across international policy processes, including CBD, right, can help enhance ambition, it can help with clarity on implementation and high quality outcomes. Um, it's just, it, it's interesting sometimes that we we negotiate the atmosphere apart from our lands and waters at the UNFCCC versus CBD or maybe IMO, but frankly, the, the planet doesn't care about any of our arbitrary distinctions and, um, you know, parties can call for sort of enhanced collaboration, information exchange, alignment between those those places. And, and as we've been hearing from, from Trey and Britt, like there really is no Paris without Montreal. And we're, we're looking forward to strong outcomes at CBD 15. I would only just add that it's there, the, the administration has shown some encouraging signs by, uh, by appointing Monica Medina to the State Department to basically be the biodiversity czar. And so I, I would say that if uh, for for any anyone on the hill who wants to 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 get action uh, to create some action around this, they they would they have a they have a partner in Monica Medina. Dan, I think it's over to you for maybe an audience question or whatever our next question is. Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, so we actually multiple people have asked. Uh, who have written us with basically the same question. And so I'm going to blend those together. This question is coming from Capitol Hill. It's coming from research institutions. And so I think it's a really interesting one and probably one that's on the minds of many other people in our audience. And the, the question is revolves around the idea of how permanent natural climate solutions are. And so, uh, Trey, maybe it's fair to start with you since our questioners are mainly talking about trees uh, and you're our tree person today. Um, but you know, how much should we actually be counting on natural climate solutions to deliver long-term uh, sequestration benefits? What happens if you know we're counting on you know these counting on forests and trees, but as climate change is getting worse, they become more susceptible to wildfires, and all of those sequester all of those carbon sequestration benefits are wiped out. How, how should we think about the permanence of what we've been talking about today, given? sort of the severity of climate impacts. And then I'd, after we hear from Troy, I'd really interesting, really interested to hear what other panelists have to say too. So I would say that there's permanent as, as far as we protect them. Um, they, if, if as long as we are continuing efforts to conserving and and, uh, and restoring the, the forests that are, uh, that that have been degraded, the, uh, the, the, the longer the effects will go. So there are, and not all forests are created equal. So, for example, the tropical forests have significantly more uh, carbon sequestered and have sorry, significantly more um, adaptive capacity and, and also uh, ability to sequester carbon and also have the ability to sequester carbon in unique ways, not only in the, in the tree biomass themselves, but also in their soils and especially uh, th uh, specifically um, specific forests such as peat forests uh, can sequester simply uh, can sequester more car can sequester more carbon than others. So if we're looking to pick and choose forests, we we want to conserve the standing forests. And like I showed before in one of my slides, how certain kinds of forests and the carbon within them is are are um, if once we lose them, they're gone. Um, so I, I would say we really need to focus on that. And and it, it, even in areas such as boreal forests and 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 forests that aren't in tropical regions, they still will have the adaptive 
adaptive capacity to grow um, regardless of climate shocks. The trees are far, are, can adapt to it, and we and we may be having to choose and select different types of trees and different types of forest, and and kind of design the natural habitat to to uh, to address some of these shocks. So to be doing tree selection for reforestation uh, after a forest fire could be uh, could be something that we need to uh, do in a in an intentional way, but they will always have the capacity to do so. Um, so long as we, as long as we uh, take take care to not allow too far conversion, and allow um, desertification to happen. That's something that's it's happening across uh, across the uh, uh, across the the Sahara uh, and the Sahel region of Africa, for example. So there are ways to to kind of reinject um, the the right nutrients that, and in order to regrow those forests. But it's something we need to do now. We need to do fast. We need to do it in an intentional way. So um, yeah. So that. Be mine. So I'd love to hear my, what my colleagues think. Britt, you unmuted. I'll take that as a sign you have something to say. And then Courtney and John, interested in your perspectives as well. Yeah, sure. For, for my sins, I can't help it, but I'm, I'm an economist. And so my, my main thing here is um, it will be permanent as long as we make it worth people's while that they stay there, right? You know, uh, make sure the forest is worth more standing than cut down. Make sure that the, we keep giving incentives to farmers and ranchers to keep the carbon in their soils. Make sure that we figure out ways to make the wetlands and the peatlands valuable. So it's a really sort of this is a, a call to action for policymakers, right? It will not be permanent if we take away the incentives, if we make it more valuable to put a strip mall somewhere. So anyway, that's my little call to action as an economist. Yeah, similar line of thinking here in that. I think permanence perpetuity is a challenge with any policy. It's not limited to natural climate solutions. So I would just couch it in, in that sort of perspective. Um, but I, I do know that, you know, there, there is going to be a need for high integrity with all sorts of um, these, these schemes, right? And making sure that permanence, the adequate amount of buffer is included in project sites so that in case there is a hurricane or a wildfire, that there is um, maybe an over conservative approach to uh, maintaining the the carbon stock and integrity in, in, in that transaction is going to be really important. Thanks, Courtney. John, I think this gives you the last word in our briefing today. Yeah, like I totally agree with all those answers. Um, and, and the only thing that I would add on top of that is we can't wait to see. You know, we keep seeing more United Nations and more IPCC reports coming out that says we have less time and less time and less time to deal with climate. We need to do everything we possibly can if we're going to reach two degrees or 1.5 degrees. Well, unfortunately, that brings us to almost the end, uh, and I know we have um, um, we have you know we have to wrap up. It's been a really really interesting briefing. I've been really looking forward to this topic, and um, I think you know going to Egypt next week or next weekend. I'm really interested to see how this topic comes up. How is it dealt with? How is it addressed? And um, uh, really interested in following along. And your four presentations were a great introduction to the topic and also what to expect. Um, speaking of what to expect, next week, November 2nd, it will be our um, our final briefing in this series, specifically looking at what's on the table for the negotiation. So uh, if you uh, want to know about you know, what to, you know, what to look ahead to, there it is right there uh, at 11 a.m. Um, we'll be talking about all of the issues, not just natural climate solutions. So I encourage everyone to tune in. And then after COP, uh, we will come back and we will uh, look backwards and we'll have a recop what happened? What does it mean for U.S. policy? What does it mean for Congress? Uh, and that will be December 2nd. Uh, we will be getting um, uh, briefing notices out uh, and reminders. But uh, the best way to sign up for all of our resources is to do just what this slide says, which, just, which is to sign up for our COP newsletter uh, and to RSVP for our briefings. Uh, those are great resources, and I think everyone will find them really useful. Um, like to say thank you to John and Trey and Courtney and Britt for four really tremendous presentations. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it was uh, awesome to get to know you a little bit during this process and to learn uh, from all of your various uh, expertises and perspectives. I'd also like to once again shout out our friends uh, at U.S. Nature for Climate. Uh, Nathan uh, Henry and his great uh, colleagues uh, were really instrumental in helping us pull this briefing together, organize it, come up with sort of the, the the approach to how to talk about this issue in a way in a way that's meaningful for our congressional audience. So thank you so much for being our valued partner uh, today. Uh, but also 
our value partner even when we don't have a briefing. It's great to work with those folks over at US Nature for Climate. Also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Anna for helping us with the questions and answers, and everyone else here at EESI who helped pull together or put together our briefing today. That includes Dan O'Brien, Omri Laporte, uh, Emma Johnson, uh, Allison Davis, Anna, uh, Savannah Bertrand, and Molly Brindamore. Thanks so much for all of the hard work. Thanks to also to our fall interns, Alina, Shreya, and Nick, who are helping us with the live tweeting and the notes and everything like that. We're at 2.30, but one last thing, uh, my colleague Emma just put up a slide with a survey link. Uh, if anyone in our audience would like to take two minutes to share uh, with us uh, your experiences today, did you have any audio problems, video problems? Was the, the closed caption not working? Do you have ideas for future briefing topics? Um, any feedback at all, we are more than more than happy, more than appreciative to receive it. We read every response, uh, and so it means a lot to us when people in our audience take a few moments to share feedback with how today went. We'll go ahead and wrap up. I hope to see everyone next week uh, for what's on the table for the negotiations on November 2nd. And until then, TGIF, have a great weekend. Thanks again to our panelists, and we'll see you next week.